something that will not stop until I guess revenge. Me. The Dark Knight's trilogy remains one of the most successful Batman franchises WB has ever had. With its immense popularity, you'd expect the series to spawn many spin-offs and supplementary material to capitalize off that success. Sadly, there's way less additional content than you'd expect. It was limited to animated shorts with questionable canonicity and a Batman Begins video game that received mediocre reception. However, other Dark Knight projects were in development but never saw the light of day due to difficulties with the game's engine. However, another Dark Knight game was also in development that was meant to tie in to Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight Rises, a game that was being developed by Monolith Studios and served as a precursor to their Shadow of Mordor games. This game, whose existence has been known for four years, has recently taken the spotlight as a series of early gameplay videos have emerged on the internet. So in this video, I'd like to analyze these gameplays with the help of game preservationist Back to Life, who posted the original videos on the Wayback Machine seeing how the game differed from the Arkham series, how it handled its deep and complex mechanics, the game it borrowed its features from, and why it never saw the light of day. After the relative success of Monolith's horror FPS Fear 2, the company looked to begin work on their next project, although Warner Brothers hoped they'd start work on their third Fear game. Monolith was reluctant as they dedicated five years to the Fear franchise at that point. Instead of working on another Fear game, they'd begin to browse through Warner Brothers' library of IPs to adapt. Seeing the major success of Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy and the surprise hit that was Rocksteady's Batman Arkham Asylum, Warner Brothers and Monolith saw the opportunity to craft another new Batman game that will tie into Christopher Nolan's third Batman film that was still in development. This Batman game, codenamed Project Apollo, was envisioned as an open world title where the player could explore a giant sandbox and engage in linear missions sprinkled throughout the map. Regarding map design, the game took on the appearance of Nolan's grounded Gotham City meaning it resembled cities like Chicago. The obvious downside to this is that the city lacked any sort of personality when you compare it to a game like Batman Arkham City for example. Although the city itself is nothing special in terms of looks, the traversal system may have garnered more intrigue from the player. Batman could glide throughout the city using his cape. I know that that doesn't sound very interesting. We can't say much about this gliding system as it does exactly what we would expect it to, allowing you to traverse the city at a pretty slow pace. And presumably, you could use grappling to help you stay in the air longer, like the Arkham games. There are upgrades that allow you to extend the range of the grapple and even use a maneuver called rapid grappling, which may have been similar to the mechanic from Batman Arkham Knight. These upgrades could also just be referring to combat, as grappling was integrated into the combat system. The only notable thing to mention about the gliding system is the diving animation off the gargoyle, which Rocksteady themselves would not use until Batman Arkham Knight. Supposedly, the developers wanted verticality to be an essential part of the traversal, so it was clear that the gliding system was a critical part of the experience. Batman would not only be able to travel using his gliding, the Batmobile would have served as a primary mode of transportation for the player, allowing them to speed through the streets of Gotham. However, 
it's worth noting that the developers at the time had yet to implement it into the game, although models do exist for the vehicle. One notable icon present on the map is an area called a safe house. It's not entirely clear what a safe house was supposed to be. Perhaps it was a place where the player could go in order to upgrade their bat suit or acquire new gadgets, similar to the bat cave from Batman Arkham Asylum. But if I had to guess, the area was an enemy stronghold that Batman had to break into and use his combat skills to take out the goons within. Combat is of course the most vital element in the Batman Arkham games and it's so well put together that many games in the industry borrow from it, even today. However, Combat and Project Apollo took a drastically different approach. I'd say the combat was closer to Batman Begins than any Arkham game and you can see this briefly through the limited looks at it. Based on the footage, it seems Project Apollo's combat took on a more beat-em-up style system which involved the player using different button combinations to do a plethora of different combos. Combat mechanics are broken down into six categories, including combos, which are self-explanatory, knockdowns, which are maneuvers that allow you to ground an enemy, knockbacks, which force enemies away from the player to give yourself breathing room, stuns, which of course stun enemies, counters, which enable you to of course counter an attack in different ways, and special moves, which allow you to trade a combo for a special maneuver to instantly take down an enemy or a swarm of enemies. By interacting with the upgrade system, players can add even more maneuvers to each one of these categories allowing players to mix and match their different abilities, giving them the upper hand by giving them even more extensive variety of moves to be used. Project Apollo's combat system is a bit more complex than the straightforward free flow system. Not only is the combat system complex, but according to this gameplay, the player could utilize many different fighting styles, giving them even more variety in combat. However, Based on the wording, Batman can only use one fighting style at a time and it requires players to reallocate stat points to gain access to a different fighting style. The combat system also provides the player with combat tech which allows Batman to upgrade his suit in different ways such as providing increased combat armor, attack strength, and a variety of other special abilities. The combat in Project Apollo delivers something a bit slower paced and grounded compared to the heptic nature of the free flow system. This approach to slower and more grounded mechanics may have also played a role in the stealth system, which like the combat, is very interesting. Stealth in the Arkham games is another well-crafted element of the experience allowing you to truly feel like Batman stalking his prey and taking each enemy down one by one. The AI makes this even better, which becomes more frantic and unpredictable the more you terrify them. With a stealth system this well put together, it's hard to imagine a different developer putting together a completely different stealth mechanic that's equally as good. However, I believe the monolith managed to do it. It's worth pointing out that Monolith's stealth system does share elements with the Arkham games, but a bit more restrictive due to their upgrade system. The ability to grab enemies through cover and other hiding spots for example have been turned into upgrades you have to invest in. Glide kicking has also been turned into an upgrade, with players having to purchase a silent version for stealth encounters. Players can also buy silent takedowns, allowing them to take down an enemy without alerting others. Huh? Despite these minor similarities to the Arkham games, Project Apollo does take some creative liberties with the stealth mechanics, but does still borrow features from another game. I'll have Back to Life explain how the stealth was different from the Arkham games. So in terms of the stealth gameplay, 
Obviously you can see in the footage, there's various vision modes for the cowls, similar to Splinter Cell. And also similar to Splinter Cell is the emphasis on light and shadow in stealth and covert movement, such as hugging walls to reduce your general presence and visibility in a room. So lighting was going to play a big part in the stealth systems in the game. Project Apollo's stealth system took a much more grounded approach when compared to Arkham based on the upgrade trees. Players had more limited options when it came to approaching stealth encounters, at least when you compare it to something like the Arkham games. So instead of zipping through gargoyles and quickly dispatching enemies, players had to be slower and more methodical. Methods like hugging walls to avoid touching enemies in narrow corridors, throwing smoke bombs to avoid detection while taking down goons one by one, and just like the Splinter Cell games, hiding within patches of shadow to avoid enemy detection. This ability to hide within shadow was an important feature considering that the upgrade tree allowed the player to conceal their presence in shadow more effectively such as camouflaging within it, and even quickly escaping into shadow after a takedown. Another significant difference with the Arkham games is how Detective Vision functioned. Detective Vision in the Arkham games was a handy mechanic. It highlighted different points of interest in every enemy in a given area, even through walls. It's been stated that the developers thought the mechanic was a bit too convenient. So in sequels, they aim to find ways to reduce its usability while not taking away from what made the feature so special. Monolith seemed to have found a way to incorporate Detective Vision into Project Apollo while also counteracting the immense convenience of the mechanic. The different vision modes is also something a little bit different to Arkham. As you can see, there's things like night vision. Whereas in the Arkham games, you simply have detective mode, which functions as a one-size-fits-all solution for all of the detective work and general information gathering and interaction with the environments in the Arkham games. Detective Vision in Project Apollo behaves more like night vision as the enemies are only highlighted when you have a line of sight rather than being able to see them through walls. This means that vision mode is only helpful in dark locations or when an enemy's vision is obscured through smoke. This means that players have to be much more proactive about utilizing shadow in their gameplay and memorizing enemy paths. Vision mode only serves as a limited tool to help them in stealth. Again, much like the Splinter Cell games. Vision mode in Project Apollo also had different modes that players could access. One is detective mode, which allows you to scan objects. The other mode is pretty unclear. To aid in your ability to hide within shadow, it seems Batman is given some gadgets created explicitly for that purpose, such as an EMP that disturbs electronics and large lighting equipment when activated. Although we don't know for sure, based on the description of the stealth upgrade tree, manipulating the emotion of enemies may have played a role in the game, similar to Arkham's Predator mechanic and Batman Begins fear system. The ability to hide within shadow is one of Batman's best traits, and it's cool that Monolith attempted to integrate this aspect of the character into gameplay. In terms of open world progression, the game featured what you'd expect from a game of this type. There were of course general robbery missions where the player had to stop a robbery. There were driving missions which indicate that racing events or car chases were taking place. Attack missions which involve Batman attacking a stronghold or disrupting a gang meetup. Protection missions where Batman had to protect a character from being attacked like a monk for example, as this mission indicates. 
challenge missions, which of course refer to combat and stealth challenges. Stealth missions that require Batman to use stealth primarily, and missions that are called Find Gatto. The game offered a variety of other open world activities, including crime scene investigations. While not central to the game, these missions provide unique gameplay. For one mission, players had to locate a kidnapped girl, the daughter of murdered lawyer Edgar Zidi, targeted by an unknown crime syndicate. How'd they take this guy out? What, you think mob lawyers don't have families? He had it coming. I bet he wasn't even surprised when it happened. Based on in-game screenshots and gameplay, players had to break into a location, take down the goons within, and then gather and analyze evidence to reconstruct events and rescue the girl before she faced harm. So perhaps there may have been some kind of time limit in the game. These detective sequences likely featured mini-games such as DNA matching to aid at tracking down suspects. Detective work would have played somewhat of a role in the game. As far as I can tell, it would have presented itself primarily through forensics minigames, such as the audio filter diagnostics, which is similar to the cryptographic sequence of minigame from Arkham Asylum, and the police radio tower minigame from Marvel Spider-Man on the PlayStation 4. There is also DNA sequencing, circuitry and hacking minigames that would have been part of general infiltration gameplay. Enemy AI would have worked a bit differently in this game compared to the Arkham games. In fact, enemy AI were much more of a critical factor in the player's experience, especially when you compare it to its closest equivalent, Shadow of Mordor. The orcs in Shadow of Mordor were unique from traditional game enemies, as they could remember the player as long as they didn't kill them. This unique mechanic, the Nemesis system, would allow you to build a relationship with an orc as you become familiar with their personality and battle tactics. If an orc managed to kill you, they'd be able to rise up the ranks in their army and become stronger, perhaps challenging other orcs in order to gain more strength taunting the player the next time you meet them. The goons from Project Apollo behaved similarly, as they utilized an early version of this mechanic. As you say, the Nemesis system was part of the game. To what extent, it is hard to say. Nolan's Batman spent the majority of his career in-universe dismantling the mob, and the mob structure seems like the most logical comparison to the Orc factions in Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War with a very similar hierarchy. It would certainly make sense as far as intimidation within the ranks of the mob and creating encounters with mob members, such as them remembering their battles and your previous interactions with them as you go about the course of the game and dismantling the overall criminal network. Although we don't know the extent of the Nemesis system's influence on the game, we know that it was integrated into gameplay. First of all, according to the upgrade tree, Batman could interrogate goons to extract information. This is similar to the worms from Shadow of Mordor, where a player could uncover information about an orc general by interrogating them, giving us information about their strengths and vulnerabilities and weaknesses. It's also possible that this interrogation system was borrowed from the Splinter Cell games. It was a mechanic that allowed you to extract certain pieces of information about the mission you were on, but it was not very complex. Oh god! I'll tell you anything! Good, start with your boss. What's his name? Uh, Nedich! Uh, Mylon Nedich! He's in charge of all our VIP protection contracts! By interrogating criminals, players may have been able to extract information about unique enemies called bosses who likely possessed remarkable abilities, immunities, and weaknesses we could exploit. Again, this may have been only an early version of the Nemesis system, so we can't really speculate much on how it would have worked. The focus meter is another feature Project Apollo shares with Shadow of Mordor. In Mordor, focus allowed players to use special abilities. This included slowing down time briefly when using a bow and arrow, 
using a special quick dash, etc. Since focus was also present in Project Apollo, it likely means that the player could use special abilities as well. This is proven by the upgrade tree, which includes a unique ability like quick dashing. Suit progression, unlike the Arkham games, played a significant role in Project Apollo, as the more players upgraded their suit, such as adding additional gadget slots, the more the suit would evolve throughout the experience, allowing the player to see themselves becoming more powerful. But one of the interesting things is, is the bat suit itself would actually change throughout the game. Now, this is most likely part of the progression system as you upgrade the bat suit and upgrade your armor levels and such, but it may have also been possible that the bat suit will have upgraded along with the story. It's important to know that although this game was an active development, it's not entirely clear if this would have ever saw the light of day. First of all, they never had approval from Christopher Nolan to make this game to begin with. Even though this served as a tie-in project, Nolan never approved of its development. While Monolith repeatedly tried contacting Nolan, they could never get in touch with him. With Nolan unable to approve of the game, development on the project halted. There were suggestions to shift the project to a more original Batman story so development could continue once again. However, considering that Rocksteady was actively developing their own original series of Batman games, it was highly unlikely that Project Apollo would have ever been made. The build itself is of quite a high quality, indicating that it at least made it a short way through development. It's very important to note that this game was developed alongside Batman Arkham City. After the success of Arkham Asylum, it's doubtful that Warner Brothers wanted to have two separate Batman game franchises running in parallel. While the game would be shut down, the developers' efforts would not be in vain, as several gameplay systems and ideas created for Project Apollo would be reworked into the developers' next title, Shadow of Mordor. 